Donald Trump has been gagged twice, but not yet bound by a judge in the last two weeks. This time, Judge Tanya Chutkin of the D.C. Circuit Court, after a two-hour hearing, told Trump and his lawyers in no uncertain terms that his violent rhetoric attacking individuals by name for just doing their job in the criminal justice system must immediately come to an end while also frequently reminding him that to her, as a federal judge, he's just a criminal defendant facing four felony charges and who is supervised by the federal criminal justice system and his freedom is at her discretion. She schooled Donald Trump's lawyers on old English history and painted them into a corner all in one hearing. But now that it's in place, what happens when Trump violates it? And is Judge Chutkin ready to put Trump in jail for any recidivism? And what about his newly filed notice of appeal that I actually already started laughing about before I could finish my intro? The Office of Attorney General in New York continues with week three of the civil fraud case against Donald Trump. And Trump decided to attend this time again. The Trump Circus is back in town. Judge Angoron holds Trump's entire business world in his hands ready to drain it of all of its cash and put them out of business. Now that we are through with another five witnesses, how is the case going for Trump and the Office of Attorney General so far as Karen and me handicap where we think we are at the three-week mark as the Trump circus returns to town without the popcorn, but with plenty of crapping elephants? Mar-a-Lago should be the name of a Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall film noir movie. But unfortunately, it's become more of a Rocky Horror Picture Show in the hands of Judge Cannon. Will any of her postponements, cancellations, adjournments, and favors for the Trump side mean that the May 2024 trial date is a lost cause? Karen and I debate that one. Finally, jury selection for the estimated five-month trial of Trump lawyers and co-conspirators in the Georgia election interference case starts on Friday as the court squares away denying last gas motions filed by Ken Chesbrough and Sidney Powell and focuses instead on what the jury selection process for the anonymous televised jury and questionnaire will look like. All the while, the prosecution gets a last-minute gift in the form of 15,000 allegedly missing emails and text messages that just turned up involving Misty Hampton, the former Coffee County election supervisor, fake elector, and current co-conspirator. What does that do to the case against Sidney Powell, who was involved with Misty Hampton in breaking into the voting machines in Coffee County? All this and so much more on the midweek edition of Legal AF with your co-hosts, Michael Popak and Karen Friedman Agnifilo. Karen, (laughs) <laughs> Where are you? You're not in a library. You're not in a bookcase. Where are you? Yeah, I'm in a different room tonight. I had to find <laughs> find a place, a quiet place to be able to to record. This is, so. this is a quiet place sometimes. This is, <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is a quiet place. But we've got, you know, Trump on trial. We you know, we have to always kind of use road roadmap and 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 landmarks which case we're talking about so so we can keep it straight and the audience can keep it straight between his civil cases, his his uh, his criminal cases, his state cases, his federal cases, the ones where he's been sued, the ones where he's suing this country overseas. It's very hard. He's he's a very litigious little boy. And I loved your to- I loved I loved your Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, <laughs> reference in your opening. Although, don't disparage Rocky Horror Picture Show by saying anything <laughs> negative. I don't know about you, but I was one of the. You know, back in the day, I was, oh, yeah. I was going to the original, you know, we'd go to the, the Roxy and we'd see it. and Bring our umbrellas. It was crazy. Yeah. We would go at midnight, you know, I grew, you know, I grew up in LA. So we'd go to Hollywood yeah. where oh, they yeah. would broadcast it at midnight and, you know, the audience participates oh, yeah. very dramatically. It was a lot of fun. Don't you remember you had to bring the umbrella when they were in the rainy scene? You had to put up the umbrella? Everything. Yes. Yeah. That was super fun. Was super fun. Unfortunately, and we'll get there later in the segment, you know, it's not super fun watching 
watching uh, Aileen Cannon, the judge in federal court, uh, fumble around in the dark for the light switch, trying to figure out how to run her case. I'll, we'll debate a little bit whether I think that trial date's going to move with all of her slow footing about things related to classified documents and whether witnesses need to get other lawyers because there are conflicts and her taking her gavel and going home with her one day because she was in a huff about the Department of Justice and clutched her pearls over it. By the way, that's not misogynist. I use clutching pearls for men as well. <laughs> I just like great, that. By the way, it's a great... Oh, I, I, yeah, do I, like, I do declare. Oh. <laughs> That's all I mean. It's more, of, it's more of a Southern thing than it is a, ah. a male female thing. Let's talk about what we hoped would happen, and it finally happened after a two hour, a two hour hearing. Um, uh, the gag order by Judge Chutkin, who sort of has had enough. And here's a couple of things I, I observed. I'll turn it over to you for your observations. One. How smart is Judge Chutkin? She is so smart. And 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 my favorite part of the hearing, well, I had a number of favorite parts. One of them was a recognition, and she let it be known early on, that she knew everything that was going on. She knew about, of course, Judge uh, Angoron's principal law clerk being attacked. She knew all about the violent rhetoric that Donald Trump had been using since the last time they all got together to talk about potential gag orders. And she was none too pleased about it. And she laughed out loud. And, and frequently shook her head when John Laura, who was the lead lawyer for Donald Trump, made his arguments. And when he said he's been a good boy and he hasn't done anything bad and there's no reason for a gag order. And she laughed out loud <laughs> because she knew that that was not true. And she reminded the Trump side that there are statutes on the books that deal with uh, 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 criminal statutes that deal with witness intimidation. Uh, it's never a good start when you're talking about a gag order. The judge reminds everybody, potentially, uh, pr particularly Trump, about that. And she also said to the to um, the comment that it's just words. It's just words. He's not really done anything. And she said violent rhetoric has a real world consequences. And she used the famous line about Henry II, uh, will you know, will will someone please rid me of this troublesome priest, referring to the Can the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury in the 1100s, and that led four knights uh, to take him up on that, their king, and go and kill the Archbishop of Canterbury based on just those words, which is a lot a lot of what Donald Trump says. Oh, I I was I wasn't wishing anybody assassinate my opponents or judges or law clerks or do violence. Just like Jen Sex. Oh, I, I said it'd be wild. I didn't tell him to do exactly that, but you do, because your words have impact and import and exhortation, and you're telling them to do something, just like Henry II did. And so I know John Laurel, I'm sure, had no idea what she was talking about with that. And then she painted him into a corner. She said, um, Your client can't, because he's a part of the justice system and supervised under my supervision released under my supervision. He can't just say anything. Um, and he's, his First Amendment rights are going to have to yield to the uh, swift administration of justice. Don't you agree? And he said, 100%. That's what he said in the courtroom. Outside the courtroom, he said that there was no gag order that was going to, pr that was going to stop his client from talking um, and, and the way he has been talking, and that he basically dared the judge that if she founds him, finds him in contempt in the future for violating the gag order, because what's a gag order without a punishment if somebody violates it? Uh, basically challenging and daring the judge to jail his his client. Um, I want to talk to you about that as well. What you pick up from the both the oral argument, the two-hour hearing, and then the actual order itself that came out about two days later? So I, on, on the one hand, you want to say, gee, it's about time, right? That somebody has tried to put or started to put limits on on what Trump can do and who he can threaten. I mean, the, the Judge Angoran gag order was very limited, very specific. It, it just said you can't threaten court staff because he, he went after uh, one of his clerks saying she had an affair with Chuck Schumer and was doxing her, et cetera. And that was a very limited, just you can't threaten court staff uh, 
I guess gag order is what is what they call it colloquially. Um, but the but as far as Judge Chutkin, this is the first time we've seen a very specific limit on what he can and cannot do. And he she didn't give the special counsel's office everything they asked for. She gave them some of what they asked for and um, and then limited it as well. So she was very, very measured. She was very specific. But, you know, you want to say it's about time. I mean, you know, I, I've said this uh, more times than I can count. I've written about it. I've done hot takes about it. Um, but no other criminal defendant would ever be treated this way. No other criminal defendant would ever be allowed to do what he is doing. I've seen it a hundred times in my career where a criminal defendant uh, does anything remotely like what Donald Trump is doing, they get put in jail during the pendency of the case. They, they lose their freedom because they are threatening people. They are potentially causing others to harm people. And Donald Trump knows that his actions have consequences and his words have consequences, right? He, he said in, in his CNN town hall to Caitlin Collins, he said, my followers listen to me like no one else. He knows it. And he knows it also because, as you just said, Jan 6, right? His words caused that to happen. And he also knows, because it's been widely reported, how many people have death threats and other, you know, need 24 seven protection, right? At, um, Alvin Bragg after the baseball hat to his head that Trump did had white powder sent to his office and death threats and hate filled racist, you know, comments made. And whether it's Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, whether it's General Mark Milley, whether it's who you name it, one of the prosecutors, uh, court staff, they all, everybody will talk about what happens to them when Donald Trump puts their name out there and makes accusations. And so he can't in good conscience remotely say he doesn't know that it's going to happen. In fact, now when he says it, he clearly intends it to happen. And any other criminal defendant would have been put in long ago. And Donald Trump, unfortunately, or fortunately, he decided to, he knew this was all coming down the pike. He knew that it would be very limited what anyone could do. And so I think one of the reasons he declared his candidacy for the Republican nomination uh, to, for president is partly for this reason, because it's made him effectively, uh, pr you know, he, he is, he's, he's sort of jail proof, uh, at this point. So, so it, look, you know, at the hearing, it was a, a two plus hour hearing and it was clear that Judge Chutkin was very prepared. She, she did a whole hype. She gave a lot of hypotheticals to John Loro and, and basically said, you know, look, he, you, he's not allowed to threaten anyone. He's not, you can disparage certain people, but why do you have to call, you, you, you can say, you know, this is a witch hunt or this is politically motivated, but why do you have a right to call Jack Smith a thug? She you actually know? went on that one, on that one, um, KFA, she went even further. She said to John Loro, in what world, in what case that you're aware of, would your would a defendant calling a prosecutor a thug allow him to continue to walk free? In other words, they would be in jail. Tell me that world, Mr. Lauro, that that exists. And she and went that, on to say, yeah. too, if you call someone a thug enough times, doesn't that suggest that someone should get them off the streets, right? I mean, she really, she didn't just let John Lauro kind of get away with saying things. She really knew her facts and she knew what she was going to say. And she went back at him. So, you know, to, to answer your other, your, your other kind of point that you made, which I think is a, a good one, is how is this going to be enforced? I think that's the rub. I think that's the, the, the problem here, because obviously the order is pointless without some sort of enforcement mechanism. Um, he's going to violate it in some way. He's going to walk the line, certainly, but he's going to violate it at some point. And then what, right? At what point and how will, how will it be enforced? And I think that that's really, um, I think that's really going to be the tricky, the, the tricky part here. I think at a minimum, what will happen is she will make the trial go sooner, um, which she has has said she might do. Um, but you know, then you you get into due process issues, or she could fine him. But she's not putting him in before trial. But but I think we could potentially um, 
see some kind of strong admonishment, but I don't see her putting him in. What about you? You know, it's, it is, um, there are many things I love about Judge Chutkin. She always on her docket when she makes her entry on any of her orders, she reminds everybody that Donald Trump is released on his own personal cognizance and is still under the supervision of the federal justice system. Cannon doesn't do that down in, in Florida. And that's a constant reminder that she, her, her North Star for all of her decision making is this is an, as you said earlier about your approach as a prosecutor, this is an ordinary defendant. I don't care what his day job is. I don't care what his day job was. Politics will be left at the courthouse steps. They have no place in my courtroom. And as John Loro, for the fourth time since this case has been filed, asked for another continuance, she made it clear, and I'll come into your, your answer to your question. She made it clear to the judge that the election cycle is going to yield to her trial. And she's not, she said, she basically said it's set in stone. She didn't use the come hell or high water phrase that Judge Angoron did last year about his trial in October, but it, she, she's, she said the exact same thing. They are, she is not moving her March trial for many reasons. One, there's no reason to. Secondly, she believes as part of the justice system, it is important that the voters understand whether they're voting for a convicted felon or not, or whether he's going to get somehow absolved. One way or the other, it's important that that happen before November and not after November. So hell or high water, she's going to try her case. Approaching it that her only concern is the fair and swift administration of justice, and she's not going to let anything get in her way. Therefore, if having now drawn the line in the sand, and capped him, capped him at his kneecaps and said, this is the geography that you are now going to have to navigate as candidate Trump. You are not to violently uh, attack, and it'll be up to me to decide what is violent, what is attack. You or any interested people, I'll tell you who the interested people are. It wasn't defined in the order, could include the Trump kids, uh, where he uses Eric and or Don Jr. as his proxies. Um, or others, I'll decide that. So he, she left enough ambiguity in order to make him worry. She, her fear, I can tell from writing the order, that's why it's only two pages, that if it was more detailed, it would just create areas that he he thought he could uh, do to try to violate it. So she left it broader so that he'd have to worry about whether she, and she said in her order also, She's not going to wait around for a uh, filing by the prosecutor to bring it to her attention. She said, I'll do it sua sponte, on my own. If she reads or hears that he is violently attacking through rhetoric individuals on the prosecutor team, the investigatory team, her staff, witnesses, or anything else that she thinks is part of the ecosystem of the federal uh, criminal justice system, She's going to call the lawyers back in and have a conversation. I think that if he, Donald Trump, doesn't figure out a way quick, and so far he's shown an inability to grow a brain overnight, to navigate this minefield that she has just set in front of him, he's going to be back there on a motion for contempt or a sua sponte judge pulling people in on the carpet of her courtroom. And, and she's then going to have to figure out what is her punishment. She can't leave it toothless. It can't just be a rap on the knuckles. It has to be a progressive, depending upon how many times he does it, a progressive series of punishments. It won't be immediately grab a toothbrush and go see the bailiff. That's not happening. But it will be, I am very troubled by it what- happened to, It happened to Sam Bankman Freed. I know. I'm just, I'm, no, but know, my but point is people, I, I'm only calling it out because yeah. I want people to see how Donald Trump yeah. is being treated differently than everybody else. Sam Bankman free did not get graduated sanctions, did not get, you know, kind of this progressive discipline. He got put in before trial. That's what happens in the normal but course. I, but I got the butt, and then now I'm going to debate back with you. I got the butt. Sam Bankman freed is a weirdo nerd who's trying to find his next Adderall fix. And he's not, whether I like it or not, the other guy is running for president of the United States. And so we have to find a way. And this is what Chutkin is struggling 
struggling with. And But she did a good job, an elegant job of threading the needle between his First Amendment rights to be candidate Trump in campaign. And he can, and she told him in the argument and in the order, you can you want to attack the criminal justice system? Go ahead. You want to attack Joe Biden? Go ahead. You want to attack it in general and talk about your innocence? Go ahead. Don't call out witnesses by name. Don't call out my prosecutors, my FBI agents, my staff. She didn't say her, but we all know she also meant her by name, right? Don't say, will somebody rid me of this trouble, this meddlesome judge, prosecutor, this or that, because we know what will happen. Somebody will get hurt and assassinated. Other than that, she is going to let him do his thing. But my point is, the first time in, I don't believe it's going to be grab a toothbrush, go see the bailiff, you're going to jail. I think it's going to be we have to have a serious conversation about the most recent event. I am going to do the following. I'm either going to take away an affirmative defense of yours. I mean, there's things you can do that are short of putting him in jail. Not criminally. Jail, jail, jail makes him, jail, maybe, jail makes him a martyr. Jail increases his fundraising abilities. Jail is fun for you and I to talk about, but I'm not sure it helps the cause to put him away for a few days in jail. I really don't. So I don't know what she's going to have to find in the criminal case that's short of jail the first time. And then if he does it again, she's going to have no choice but but to put him in jail. I, I don't think he's going to go that far. He's already slightly chased, even though he attacked her. And he and he docks the attorney general in New York and maybe put her home address on social media when he was being interviewed about Judge Angoron, who in the past he has called a crazy, lunatic, socialist, fascist, whatever. He was interviewed yesterday after or the day after the gag order came out in D.C. And he said, I like the judge. I like Judge Angoron. I respect Judge Angoron. Angoron. I'm like, what the? This is so crazy. But um, look, step one, gag order in place. Second gag order. He's got one in New York as well about the case there. Uh, He can keep bashing at other places where he doesn't have a gag order or he has a more limited gag order. I mean, he technically has a gag order of of sorts in Judge McAfee in Georgia uh, related to what he can say or do about witnesses and other participants in the process and and in other places as well. But this one, all eyes are watching because if there's one judge out there that's going to find a way to punish him if he violates uh, a very broad gag order in that way. And I say it's broad because she didn't use specific language that he can say, oh, there, there's a comma and then there's a period. I can do the thing in between. She left it sort of, I'll decide. I'll decide who your proxies are. I'll decide what is the, the level or the nature of rhetoric. And I may even pick up the phone and call all the parties into my chambers or into the courtroom. But we'll see. First so, step is the gag order. The second step yeah. is... What happens after the category and how is he punished? So I just have one more thing. Sure. Just, just if I have to get off my chest, if it's okay with you. <laughs> this really, really bothers me. Okay. So because of all the things you said, which are true, he's running for president, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing that is being discussed in court is how this could influence the election, right? Or the trial, I apologize, and the integrity of the case, right? And that's what's being focused on. That's what Jack Smith's entire motion for this limited gag order says. It's basically to protect future jurors, to protect the witnesses, to protect the the the, the case, the integrity of the case. And they never mention the danger to people. They never mention because people could get killed or this is a crime or, you, you know, that's why he shouldn't be doing it. They just talk about, you know, his speech is, is, interfering with and infecting the integrity of the case. And that's by design, right? Because that's something the judge has the ability to do. And the reason I take issue with it is it's really sidestepping and dancing around what the real problem is. The real problem is Donald Trump's crime is his words, right? Think about the entire January 6th case, the entire crime. He didn't use a gun to commit that crime. He didn't use a weapon. He didn't, you know, he used his words. His words are what caused the entire 
the entire basis of the case of Jan 6 are his words, are his lies, are his rhetoric, are the things that cause people to go out and commit violence. And so he is continuing to commit the very crime he is charged with, right? mar a is about documents. And, you know, but Jan 6, this case, the case in front of Judge Chutkin is about his words. It's about his words that are violent, that are lies, and that are criminal. And he and he is continuing to commit these crimes. And if and God help us, God forbid one of his followers listens to what he says and does what you you know Henry the second or whatever that you know that quote that's just way too sophisticated and intellectual for me to even understand but I get what it's about and the Archbishop of Canterbury um, you know everyone knows what he's saying and what what he wants them to do and God forbid somebody gets hurt we are all going to look back and say it could have been prevented and that's why he should be incarcerated not for any other reason it's because he's a dangerous criminal who's putting real lives at risk honestly I care about the integrity of the case and the justice system but I care much more about people's lives I know what it feels like to have death threats you know while trying to just do your job it's not fun and it's terrible and it it it's it's actually he actually is a criminal who who should be incarcerated. And so I, I just feel very strongly that we all dance around it because he's a candidate and I just disagree with it. Yeah, I appreciate, I mean, I appreciate the position. I'm not taking it all. I'm not, I like debating you, but I'm not, <laughs> but I'm not debating you on this. It was up to no, me. No, I know. If I was up to me, he'd be drawn and quartered already. Um, no, I, but I, I, I understand the distinction that you're making and it's a good one between the other cases and this cases. And this is all about incendiary speech. Um, the whole case is about that. Exactly. The whole case is about, won't someone rid me of this meddlesome priest? That's how exactly. we got to Jan 6th. Exactly. Um, and his when it falls on the ears of, the, um, of his followers and their weird, dangerous brand of patriotism, um, lives are lost and can be lost. And I do remember federal judges being on the receiving end of bombs and weapons and guns. And if they weren't home, it was their family. We just had Nancy Pelosi's uh, husband, husband who happened to be home in his underwear get smacked in the cranium with a hammer, okay, by somebody who was incensed um, by these words. I, I just did a hot take on the pink hat lady uh, megaphone blowing uh, defendant in Jan 6, who until COVID and she became weaponized and activated like a sleeper cell, she was a, a, a green market, farmer's market yogurt person with four, eight children and four grandchildren at 40 that was more inclined to post on social media pictures of yoga poses than anything else. Within a year after that, she had fallen down the rabbit hole of Rudy Giuliani, Steve Bannon, Alex Jones, Donald Trump. She went to Gettysburg and confronted a Black Lives Matter person two weeks before Jan 6 with 50 other people, white people who surrounded a Black Lives Matter protester during the height of that movement, and then went to Jan 6 and used an ice pick to break into the Capitol, just got sentenced to four years. This, you know, if you were to pick out of a lineup somebody that would be inclined to like follow Donald Trump and do his bidding, you wouldn't pick this woman out, this grandma out, but that's what happened. And if it happens to her, you can imagine what's going to happen to somebody who's fully armed at home. And that's why Judge Chutkin, who I did a profile on in one of my hot takes, you know, poor justice. She, she's, she's an athlete. She's a former professional dancer. She, she used to run to work in her shorts and water bottle. Now she's got a bicycle to work with U.S. Marshals following her and changing her route every day uh, so that nothing happens to her. She's not going to let it stop her life. Um, but we shouldn't live in that world and that society, but we do. And you're right about Donald Trump. And hopefully- Just one other thing, Popak. I know we're going to get to it in a minute. But yeah. the, the, the New York AG trial today, you know, just today, one of his followers stands up and says, Donald Trump, can I help you, you know, in court or whatever she said. And she, she got a court employee. She, a court employee gets up and <laughs> she gets arrested. I guess that's my point. Everybody else, you know, and she should have been arrested. But so what he has done 
over and over and over and over and over and over again is so much worse. And he gets away with it. And there's just, we need to do something about it. We'll get to it. We'll get to this in a minute to talk about it. I just, I'm going to point out, you know, he says it's a witch hunt. He says it's political. I'm treated differently. You know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, Donald Trump, you are treated differently than everybody else, but not in the way that you say. So it's always the followers who end up getting arrested first while while Donald Trump remains free right? Including Jan 6 and everything else. We're going to talk about um, others who are going to pay the price um, in our justice system, but we need to talk about an update in the New York Attorney General, the Office of Attorney General, civil fraud case. It's going great if you're not named Donald Trump. Uh, If you're named the people of the state of New York, you got to be pleased with the momentum and the, um, in the opening statement, the uh, Office of Attorney General lawyer that presented the case, he wrote a lot of checks about evidence that he was going to be able, to, that their side was going to be able to put on, and they're now cashing those checks every day and every way with witnesses who are performing. And when they're not performing, like the adverse witnesses on the other side, Alan Weisselberg, that they pull in um, as a hostile witness to to make a point, and he starts uh, deviating from the script, so to speak, i.e., potentially perjuring themselves. They're ready for him too. They're ready to cross-examine him and how to cross-examine him. We're going to talk about the five or six new witnesses that have already been put on inside the organization, current employees outside the organization, appraisers and bankers and 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 the like, and about uh, an update with Judge Cannon in Mar-a-Lago as we round it out with um, uh, the jury trial that's about to start this week with jury selection in Georgia in the Fulton County election interference case. But first, a word from our sponsors. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Using silver-infused fabrics originally inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, so you get better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash legal AF to try Miracle made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo legal AF at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash legal AF and use the code legal AF to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash legal AF to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity? Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health and performance in our days. Having a consistent nighttime routine is non-negotiable. I know in my own life when I don't get enough sleep, not only am I irritable and grouchy, but my performance in work or in life suffers greatly. Introducing Beam Dream. You know we've been raving about Beam's Dream Powder, their healthy hot cocoa for sleep. And today... Our listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Now available in delicious flavors like sea salt caramel, cinnamon cocoa, and chocolate peanut butter. Better sleep has never tasted better. Dream contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, melatonin, and nano CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. 
A recent clinical study revealed Dream helped 93% of users wake up feeling more refreshed, and 93% reported that Dream helped them get a more restful night's sleep. Just mix Bean Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. I've personally tried Bean Dream, and it lived up to the hype. First off, it was delicious and just a lovely nighttime routine. And secondly, and most importantly, it helped me fall asleep and stay asleep. The next day, I woke up ready and eager to take on all life's challenges and tasks. Find out why Forbes and New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash legalaf and use code legalaf at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash legalaf and use code legalaf for up to 40% off. So we're back. Before we break at the end. Um, I love all our sleep sponsors. Whether it's I'm, Beam, I, Dream, look, or Miracle, sh- Miracle, or I look so rested, or Eight Sleep. No, seriously, I love it. <laughs> so we sometimes at the end we cram in all of the plugs for the show and how to support the show, and we do one a little bit early. We're starting to do, and it's getting some real, real um, interest. What we call Legal AF After Dark, which is we take the segments from a show like this. Let's say there's three or four things we talk about or what Ben and I do on the weekend. And we separate them into what I used to call little potlets until I once used that term and Ben said, what's that? <laughs> what I meant was like a podcast, but like little potlets. And we're using them as on, on our YouTube channel, not supposed, not for this audience right here that's so devoted and committed to sitting through an hour, hour and a half of a full length podcast, but for those that either don't know the show there are people on the Midas Touch Network that know the other our other great programming and content makers, but don't know this show. I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> but there are. Um, or have people in their lives that they'd like to introduce to the show, but you know, it's a lot of it's a big commitment to sit for an hour or over the course of a day. So this is a great opportunity. If you see one of them and you'll know them right away because we we label them as Legal AA, legal AF after dark. Send it over. Show it. Send it to people that you like in your life that you think might be interested in the show. And it's an invitation, sort of a gateway drug to get them to come to the full podcast. So there's my little plug for legal AF after dark. But we are still, well, we're after dark here too. So let's move forward into the New York Attorney General case. I'll just give you my observation as a trial lawyer in courtrooms like that one and civil cases like that one about how masterful the Office of Attorney General is doing. And it's not Letitia James. We, we always show the video where she's sitting very contently in the in the courtroom. Wait, wait, wait for this pan back here. There's a very grumpy old grumpy pants. And there is a very content looking attorney general who's very proud of the team that's presenting the case. And we've had about four different attorney generals, assistant attorney generals or special attorney generals, take on different witnesses and different aspects of the case. And that's usual for a sprawling case that's expected to go 100 plus trial days. It's under, it's hard to believe we're only third week in, but there's a lot more to go in the case in chief for the attorney general and for eventually the case will turn to the defense. A couple of things I'll observe. This momentum that's been built in the narrative of having, you know, started early on with outside witnesses such as auditors and accountants who have been longtime, um, uh, where Trump and his people have been longtime clients of of these people, starting with Don Bender for Mazers, the disgrace, discredited at least um, accounting firm that fired the client in Donald Trump after they determined that he was lying to them and he could no longer, they could no longer rely on his information for their financial serv- their financial records and certifications, starting with him. But then very quickly moving to two insider or, or, or recent insiders and the money men for the last 20 to 40 years for the Trump organization in uh, Alan Weisselberg, who, who we're going to keep coming back to time and time again in this trial, the disgraced convicted felon, but 50-year former chief financial officer, not a, not a certified public accountant, but you'd think the chief financial officer would know what 
generally accepted accounting principles are, but he testified that he did not know what that, that is. It's always good when you put somebody in a control position who doesn't understand the rules about the position. And then, and then uh, Mr. McConney, uh, who test, who's the controller, who's responsible for the control functions, there he is now, who reports to Mr. Weisselberg, and they testified um, under penalty of going to jail. I mean, McConney had an immunity deal from the prosecutor's office and testified against the Trump organization in the tax evasion case. And Mr. Weisselberg didn't have a deal, but he did get a little bit of a lighter sentence because he testified uh, also. Um, and also, um, they also had what they needed to show bias in case one of the two of them started to go off track because uh, for Weisselberg, he's entitled, if he, he'll he have to earn it, it'll be an earn out, but he's waiting on another one point uh, uh, six or $7 million dollars Oh, no, I'm sorry, $1.2 million in continued payments by the Trump organization if he plays in the sandbox well. And if he doesn't, he's going to forfeit it, which in, which indi- which sort of um, explained why it was like pulling teeth out of him in the case so far to get what they needed out of him. But they didn't have that problem with Patrick Bernie, a low-level assistant um, vice president who, uh, that's not a current picture. He's got a beard. He's a bearded man now since COVID, as most of us are. <laughs> we'll, we'll get around to putting up a current photo. But uh, this is a guy who, in, uh, in, uh, very smartly, Letitia James, who did take the deposition of Donald Trump, asked Donald Trump about a series of witnesses that they knew they were going to use at trial six months in the future to ask him what his knowledge of these people were, if he had any comment about them. And she went right down the list of her witness list, including the last few that we've seen. Do you know Mr. Bernie? I, I really don't. This is Donald Trump. You don't know the assistant vice president that works for Mr. Weisselberg? I don't. Uh, and how about this person, uh, Ms. Kidder? Uh, what does she do? Assistant controller. How long has she been with me? 18 years. No, I, I don't really know her. I don't really know her. So there were no comments. It wasn't like, no, she's a liar. No, I hate, how can you, you can't say it anyway. She's been with him for 18 years. And the guy's been with him for nine years. And all these people have now come in and just dumped on Donald Trump because they've told the truth. They've said, Alan Weisselberg told me that Donald Trump wanted us to cook the books. This is not, for those that are just tuning in for the first time, this is not a sophisticated fraud. A sophisticated fraud is not where you just make up the numbers and just change the numbers on your spreadsheet in order to dupe uh, banks, lenders, investors, insurance companies, and the like. That's not a sophisticated fraud. A five-year-old could do that. You just take your pen and where it used to say five, you make it nine. Okay, that's that's Donald Trump's. I mean, the, the little dark thing here, uh, criticism of him, is he's not even like smart and sophisticated in the fraud that he perpetrates. I can't even tip my hat to the genius that is the evil genius that is Donald Trump running his business. It's just taking a pencil and erasing numbers. And then when they knew they needed certain things like, well, somebody better validate these numbers, the bank's asking questions. Oh, I know. We'll tell the bank that our long-term outside appraiser actually gave us those numbers when he didn't. And we'll just put a little asterisk next to it and we'll add that, that gentleman's name. And so that guy's been on the stand from Cushman and Wakefield for the last two days. And Donald Trump's been in the courtroom really upset and so upset he's been gesticulating and folding. Ah, ah. So many, so many times that the office of the attorney general had, had to ask the judge to tell Trump to shut the F up because he was, I mean, this is my words, because he was interfering with and trying to intimidate the witness who was on the stand. And uh, the witness on the stand basically said, I never gave them permission to use my name. I did not do that appraisal. They should not have let the world think I did the appraisal. That's wrong. And I'm shocked that my name is on that piece of paper. You know, in cross-examination, they pulled out some emails. And like, oh, didn't you remember this email from nine years ago? No, I really don't remember that email. But it didn't really change the core of his testimony, which is um, I valued property with using proper appraisal techniques and they didn't. They use techniques that no uh, appraiser in his right mind or in good standing would ever use. And the result was a hyperinflation or cooking of the books of numbers that I didn't participate in. But if you're showing me them now, I don't agree, for instance, that 40 Wall Street, which is this tower that's half vacant downtown by the, uh, by the stock exchange is worth $600 million when I valued it at anywhere between 150 and 250. 
depending upon the year and the vacancies and that type of thing. No, I don't believe that. I think they didn't use the right capitalization rate. They didn't use the right vacancy rate. They didn't, they just fudged the numbers. And that is the heart of the persistent fraud case here. And that's why Donald Trump's getting, you can always tell when a witness is killing Donald Trump because he literally looks like he's getting killed in the courtroom. He has no poker face. He thinks this acting out is having an impact on the, uh, on the, uh, on the judge, which obviously it isn't. There he is there. But um, I think from the inside witnesses to the outside witnesses to disciplining witnesses that fall off track um, by showing their bias, I think they're just chopping wood, stacking it up methodically every minute, every hour, every day in front of a judge who's really interested in taking notes. And probably a judge has already made up his mind, let's be honest, that the other the other five counts or six counts on persistent fraud have already been met based on just the testimony in the last three weeks. What did you pick up from all this, Karen? I think that uh, the trial is going really well, as you said. I think it's very clear that that the attorney general's office knows exactly what they're doing. They're being very methodical in proving each and every element that he's charged with. I also think, though, that, you know, what you said needs to be emphasized and underscored. This is not a complicated case, right? And and the problem with, you know, this is a white collar case, essentially. And, 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 and the problem with white collar crimes is sometimes they're very complicated. I mean, so complicated that it's hard to know exactly. Like I used to supervise the um, a lot of white collar cases uh, when I was at the DA's office. And, you know, I'd be listening to the facts of a particular case when I'm talking about it with a line assistant. And I, I, I'd be like, Okay, can you just highlight for me when we get to the crime? Because you really don't even, it's so sophisticated, so complicated. Sometimes it's not that obvious what, what it is. This particular, these crimes, <laughs> what he's, or what these frauds, I should say, that he's being charged with are so simple and so unsophisticated that it's just glaringly fraudulent, right? This is not even a close call. And you know, figuring out a capitalization rate or a cap rate, as they call it in the real estate industry, is a complicated thing, right? It's not, but but there's a way to do it, right? There's there's things you look at that are objective, that, and 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 essentially it's an art. It's not a science, but but there is an art to it, and things do have inherent value, and they do have values that you can put on them. But it's it's you 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 build these things into your equation, as you said, whether it's the vacancy rate or or the you know the the occupancy you know what how, how many tenants are, are 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 occupying what you have and how much are they paying and you know all, all the different things that go what are, what are the comps nearby going for and all, all the things that go into valuing um, a building and then you get to a range or you get to a number or a, a number that has a, a range but the range is quite narrow and it's very, it's very, very um, methodically gotten to. You don't do it the other way around, right? You don't say, okay, I want this to be the number. And so let's figure out a way to lie to get to that number. I mean, that's just pure fraud, right? You don't, you don't turn around and say, I want my, I want my, I want my building to be worth a billion dollars. So let's see how I can get it that way. Let's just say it's three times bigger than it actually is. Let's just say the vacancy rate is zero when it's 80%. I mean, you can just, you know, you can't just make stuff up. Right, just to get to a number that you want, and and that's the thing that I think the the AG's office is doing a really good job at here is, you know, Donald Trump is 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 trying his you know case in the court of public opinion. He, he every time he goes to court, he goes outside and and you know gives a gives a press conference and and says what he wants and lies. You know, he just says that things happen that didn't happen, or he completely just makes up facts because he's he he knows that the judge is listening to the actual facts but he doesn't care right he wants to just the the court of public opinion to to have it be something that is you know that he wins in public as opposed to in private and his narrative is fixes in the judge has it out for me the judge has already made up his mind the judge isn't listening and all these people are lying right and that's what he's going to say that's what he's going to do and he's if he keeps saying it long enough and and enough 
he, he's going to get enough people to at least question it and say this is politically motivated. And Letitia James ran on getting Trump, getting Trump. You know, he says the same. It's like he's a broken record. If you say the same thing over and over again, it must be true, right? That's that's the that's his his philosophy. But inside the courtroom, when you analyze exactly what's happening and what's said, it's so clear that it's different than what he's saying, sometimes the opposite of what he's saying. And it's like a building block that they are, that they are coming out and, and establishing uh, that, that these things were completely fraudulent, right? They were, they weren't done in ways that that you could even say, oh, we made a mistake. You know, oh, we thought that this could be, you could factor this in, but not that. This was intentional. These were intentional, uh, intentional lies and intentional um, things that they, that he had people do and he did in order to get financial gain, uh, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because, you know, he doesn't have to go to this trial, right? He, he doesn't have to go to any of his civil cases and his civil, civil trials. He only has to go to the criminal ones. But ask yourself, why, like, why didn't he go to the Eugene Carroll trial at all? Right. You know, because why? Because he doesn't care. That's part of his persona, part of his per persona. I think he gets off on being the guy who can, you know, sexually assault women and, you know, grab them by the private parts and get away with it. I, th I think that, you know, he doesn't really want to you know, he doesn't care that much that, that that's what's being called into question to him. That's like a badge of honor, you know, to be, to be a tough guy rapist, but you know, but this is different, this trial. And he's showing up, I think for two reasons, number one, because he's trying to intimidate witnesses, right? Michael Cohen was supposed to testify this week. And so he showed up this week and even next week when they said he's going to testify, they even, the, the, the lawyers said, oh, but Donald Trump has a conflict on this day and this day and this day. So let's have it be the earliest Tuesday. Cause he, he wants to be there. Why does he want to be there? He wants to intimidate him. That's it. There's no other reason for him to be there. And so he's coming for that reason because he likes to intimidate people, number one. And number two, the other reason he's coming and he's going to this trial is because what he does care about and what everyone who's ever worked for him or knows him has said, he cares about his image when it comes to money and he's insecure about it because he knows that he's not worth what he is, is, um, what he's always said he is worth. He's not the billionaire or the multi-billionaire uh, mogul. He's he's built his house of cards is built on lies, and you know his his um, it's like he's one giant Ponzi scheme uh, when it comes to being a businessman, and he knows it, and he's insecure about it, and this cuts to the core of what he really cares about, and so that's why I think he shows up for those two reasons. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's a hundred days of trial. He's going to pick his moments. My mo the most fascinating thing for me is there's been absolutely or very limited cross examination of witnesses that work or used to work for the Trump Organization. Um, Alan Weisselberg, they said um, no questions. Uh, Patrick Bernie, who killed them uh, because he told the truth. He said Alan Weisselberg told me in his office in 2017 or 2018 that Donald Trump wanted his numbers cooked and the numbers increased in order to change his net worth. Um, and so, uh, no questions, <laughs> right? Uh, and they've done that. And then some light cross-examination of some other people. When they were challenged about that, Chris Keis, who likes these pops up like a, like a, like a, out of the, out of the um, jack out of a box there. Uh, oh, hearsay. Oh, oh, it's always late, by the way. I don't there's no jury. You got to judge, right? So a lot of the th things in histrionics you do at trial, you don't you don't do when you have a bench trial in front of a judge like this. But uh, they said, well, we're going to do some. We're, when we have them in our case in chief, three months from now, we're we're going to handle it then. I'm like, the damage is already done. The damage is already done. I mean, you can try to. You want the judge to remember the cross examination. He's already forming his opinions now, just like the jury does. And you think something three when you score some sort of point three months from now after he was already on the stand, that's going to help you. I think it's. A, I think it's a silly and foolish uh, approach. But I'm not sure they. There's got to be something they can do to cauterize the wound and stop the bleeding. But they're not. They're not doing a darn thing. But I agree with. You. There's no other reason that Donald Trump is. You can watch him in any of the video clips that we show you. And they're not self-selected. There is no reporting in the courtroom that he is he is ever, but for a moment, writing anything on a pad or sharing notes or at a break 
He's not talking to his counsel at a break because he's talking to reporters at a break. And so therefore, he's not sharing with them or participating in his defense because he's he's there. Alina Haba there is behind him over his right shoulder, right? You know what they're not doing? Preparing for the witness that's on the stand during the break. And that just shows you that it's all, you know, when he told um, the magistrate down in Florida in the Michael Cohen case, now dismissed, that he couldn't attend the deposition originally scheduled because he had to be there to participate in the defense of his organization. What he really meant was, I need to be there to be able to campaign every other day so that the news cameras focus on me and not what's going on in the courtroom itself. I don't think it's, for me, I'm a little bit, here's where the debate comes in. I don't think it's intimidation. I don't think he thinks he's intimidating anybody or changing anybody's opinion. I, I think it's to distract the news cycle and get the camera's attention and suck the oxygen out of the room, but it doesn't change for a minute what's going on in the room any more than if you and I stared at a table for the next three months, we would change any aspect of that table. What's happening behind the wooden doors in that courtroom is happening whether Donald Trump likes it or not. He's just trying to do with, he's like a, he's like a, an organ grinder with a monkey outside trying to get attention, but that's not stopping the slow methodical presentation of evidence and witnesses. Let, let's talk about, um, now that we're done talking about two cases where judges know what they're doing. Well, don't forget, case- don't forget to mention the court employee though that we said we'll talk about in a minute. Well, we did. I don't think it was a, you. You got something else you want to say about crazy? Court no, lady? no. Just sure. well, I just feel bad. I said. I said we'll talk about it. I guess but we did. There was a crazy court lady that stood up and got taken out of the court. She works for the court system. We don't really have that many more details. She was arrested, put in a car, and she yelled out that she wanted to help Donald Trump. Okay. Well, what else we got? Someone in New York, by the way, that wants to help him. It's fascinating. I, the fact that that person, they should put her under glass at the National at the Natural History Museum. I want to know, is, yeah. This is a New York Trump Exactly. Supporter. I mean, come on. That's a big, like, I, I, I thought that was kind of fascinating. I want to know more about her. 2023. She's going to be in the, nat- the Natural History Museum one day, like right next to the cavemen displays. <laughs> that's where we are with that. By the way, All can right. we go back to this picture of him in court? Sure. His, his the, the, yeah. His comb over has gotten so bad. I, I like. I don't mean to be, but and, and his orange has gotten so orange. Like sometimes he tempers it, you know, and he looks less orange, and his comb over looks somewhat normal. But like, I just want to know who does his, you know, hair and makeup. He and- is not a well man. I don't know why people think he's so hale and hearty, and they compare him to to, to Joe Biden. I mean, if you were if you were having a geriatric Olympics, I'd put my money on Joe Biden winning the decathlon, not Donald Trump. Now, if sure, when yeah. if if Wendy's or Popeyes was having a decathlon, then I'm putting my money on Donald Trump. But otherwise, no. And this trial's not helping him. This is the first time in his life. He, I don't know what he did in the other trials because he settled most of them, including with the attorney general in the past about fraud with Trump University, I don't think he's ever sat in a courtroom and watched people in and around his life testify against him and documents that he signed that showed he's committed fraud. And you're right. This is the case he he should care more about going to jail. But this is the case he apparently cares about because his entire brand is invested in him being what you and I as New Yorkers know is not true, that he's a a successful business person. We know that's been a sham forever. He's a middling, he was a middling licensee of a name. There's no legitimate, you can count on no fingers how many real real estate developers um, in the business today would ever host the Celebrity Apprentice. Put Mark Cuban aside for a minute. He's not a real estate developer anyway. That show is different. Shark Tank is different. All those people made their money and they were looking for something else to do and they went on the show and it helps their brand. A real real estate developer, a, 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 you know, like a related group or Vernado or any of these major top, they're, their chairmen are never going to host Celebrity Apprentice. That's because he was on the balls of his ass financially and he needed something to increase his value. But we know that. The American people don't know that. And that's what we're here to talk about. 
We're going to talk about Mar a Lago, Judge Cannon, what's happening there with SIPA, Karen Freeman Ignifilo's favorite acronym uh, about everything that's happening in that courtroom as she's trying the judge to, to delay, I guess, the trial that's supposed to be scheduled for May and a trial that's not going to be delayed and actually picking a jury trial in Georgia. The Georgia election interference case brought by Fawny Willis, the Fulton County DA, starts on this Friday, and we will talk about both. But first, a word from our sponsors. I am so thrilled to talk about Legal AF's latest exciting new sponsor, Copilot. Copilot is a personal training app that was listed by Forbes as the top rated personal trainer app of 2023, and I can see why. I've always wanted my own personal trainer, but I've never been able to find the time in my schedule, whether it's about work or family and all the things going on, to have the time to work with one. I also don't really like going to a gym, but I do know how important exercise is, and I like to exercise and want to incorporate it into my life and my daily routine much more. So if you're a woman like me of a certain age and you know how important it is to maintain healthy bone density and strength training and keep your heart rate up through cardiovascular exercises, that is is something that we all have to do. And it's important to find the time and and the ability to do that in your life. And Copilot is the thing that has helped me do that. And I'm so excited and thrilled to have someone from the comfort of my own home who I can video chat with. She's my own personal trainer and she can help me. She has helped me develop a routine that fits with my lifestyle, incorporates exercises that are things that I like doing, that are easy for me to do and that are fun for me to do. And she also helps hold me accountable because I know I'm going to be, uh, she's going to be seeing my and tracking my progress and seeing how I'm doing. And that has really helped me stick with my program. So it's fantastic. It's so much more than just a fitness app. There really is this personal connection and these personal personally tra- tailored exercise routines that are good for your body, your lifestyle, and your goals, your fitness and body goals. So head to go dot mycopilot.com slash legal af to get a 14 day free trial with your own personal trainer that's go dot mycopilot.com slash legal af to get a free 14 day trial with your very own personal trainer and take a back seat and let copilot help you reach your fitness goals i like when you do it from that chair you look like you're trying out for the next episode of star trek it's like you know, you're in the command chair. Sometimes you got to find, you know, it's it's not always easy when you have family and whatever. Oh, yeah. It's not always easy to find a place to, a quiet place to. I'm in my stay. office. I've had my staff walk in in the middle of the podcast, like yeah, exactly. trying to hand me, a, trying to hand me a document. Yeah, Let's well. talk about. I'm gonna let, let you lead off. Let you, you, you and Ben have become oof, the um, the uh, masters of the SIPA universe and Judge Cannon. Why don't you talk about a couple of things that have happened down there? And I've heard your opinion on the hot take, but share it here about why you think this all kind of is a conspiracy by the judge to ultimately rule that this trial of hers is not going to happen in May before the election, as we suspected. And and I'll listen to it and maybe I'll have a counterpoint. (laughs) Yeah. So look, I think, and and I've said this since the beginning, that uh, that Judge Eileen Cannon is going to, when she ruled that the trial is going to be in May of 2024, as opposed to after the election, we all said, let's see if she sticks to that. She's never going to do something ridiculous, like say, oh, it's going to be years from now or after after the election, because that she'll get criticized. So instead, she'll set a date. But then we're going to see these little teeny, I keep calling it death by a thousand cuts, right? You're going to see all these things. Okay, you have to do this by this date. But let's I need five more days, judge. Oh, okay, you can have five more days. Or I need two weeks, judge. Okay, you can have two weeks. And over time, those all add up. And I think we're going to potentially see that trial date get moved because she's constantly having uh, allowing that to, to occur. And the SEPA issue that you're talking about 
is has to do with discovery. And one of the issues is the defense attorneys are saying, you know, we don't have all the discovery. We want to see all of the classified documents and we haven't been provided them all. They've been provided many of them, but there's a few that are so, so, so highly sensitive that uh, that Jack Smith and his team are saying, look, we, we want to provide these, but we we think they're so secretive and so sensitive and such um, and so and, and so, um, you know, highly, highly classified, you know, the, the super top highly classified that we can't even try. They can't travel. They need to stay in Washington. And we want to put it in a skiff, you know, that's the, the, the room that's so secure that allows, you don't know, radio waves can't come in or out. You have to leave your devices at the door. I mean, it's the, these certain, you know, these skiffs are, are they're locked and, you know, they're, they're very, it's, it's where you can view things that are highly confidential and not worry that, you know, this information can leak out. Um, and so they said, you know, there's one in Washington. We want to keep, we want that to be, those documents to be there. Of course, the defense attorneys are saying, no, we, it's inconvenient. We want it to see it in Florida. And, uh, and Judge Cannon says, okay. And so she ordered that all of the documents have to be put into a skiff in Florida and in the Southern District of Florida. She was very specific about that. And, and so we'll see what happens. We will see if at the end of the day, if Jack Smith can find a way to convince the intelligence community that there's a safe way to bring that down there, uh, or they could potentially, they could potentially um, dismiss whatever counts have to do with those particular documents. And, you know, look, the SEPA, the Classified Information Procedures Act, the whole point of it is it's to prevent, they call it gray mail on the part of defendants. And, 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 and what that means is, is you don't want to be blackmailed because, uh, somebody steals your most secret documents and then you go to trial, you get prosecuted and they say, Oh, well, you know, guess what? I, my due process rights means you have to put into evidence what I stole, you know, what you allege that I stole in order to prove your case. And of course, the national security community is going to say, well, we can't do that. We can't put the nuclear codes in evidence that would put everyone in danger. So, so it, it's sort of a way of preventing this, this blackmail or, or gray mail. The Congress passed the Classified Information Procedures Act many years ago. And it essentially says, look, yes, due process normally requires that you have to uh, be Anything they want to use against you has to be introduced into evidence at trial. But when it comes to classified information, we're going to make an exception. And there are procedures in place that you can determine exactly what the process will be so that on the one hand, your due process rights are met. But on the other hand, national security is also taken into consideration. So you do things like you can sanitize the documents, you can redact the documents, you can summarize the documents, you can, you know, there are things you can do that that are that you can um, make it so that 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 you can still go to trial and and utilize aspects of the documents. But these particular subset of documents are so sensitive that they're saying they cannot travel. So it'll be interesting to see exactly how Jack Smith deals with it and what he does. But you know that's where that's where we we are with the. Um, you know, with the, with the SEPA situation. But again, the, the discovery, you know, between that and the, the Garcia hearing that has been happening, you know, that, that was adjourned for Walt Nauda because, you know, the, the Garcia hearing was the conflict hearing to see if, if Stan Woodward can represent him, be, even though he's represented multiple other uh, witnesses, you know, that got adjourned because the, the defense said, oh, you know, we, we're surprised. There was an argument that was made that that's new. It wasn't in the papers. And, and Judge Cannon's like, oh, you cited to a case that's not in your papers. And, you know, and you're making these these arguments that you didn't that you didn't raise before. You wasting my time, adjourn the case, you know, which is so ridiculous because that to me just shows her inexperience, right? It's 
this is a Garcia hearing. It's to determine conflicts. It's to determine whether or not uh, there's a conflict of interest in you represented this this witness that you claim you want to cross examine Stan Woodward. That witness told you things in confidence with the attorney client privilege. How are you going to possibly cross examine them? And so, but she has in, she either she has she's inexperienced or she's you know doing this stealth Donald Trump bidding for him and doesn't want to be overt about it. I don't know which which one, uh, but. You know, the, the, the fact that she thinks that new issues were raised at the hearing, I think, just shows her inexperience. Because, you know, anyone who's ever had a, a hearing before the court, that's, that's where the facts are developed. That's where the, the arguments are developed. The papers definitely are part of it, but, but you, you further develop it at the hearing. That doesn't make it new or novel in order to be adjourned. So I'm just concerned that she's, 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 um, allowing the defense attorneys who want delay and who don't want this trial to go quickly, she's allowing them to push this that so that it could potentially not happen uh, in May. I've had judges where I've lost every discovery motion um, and then some leading into a trial. And then at trial, I won every thing that mattered, including the trial. And if you had asked me at any given moment during a case, what's going on? I would say, oh, this judge is against me. I've ruled, or, or an arbitrator. We, we, I, every, every decision went the other way, to the other side. You think, the fix is in. I'm, I'm going to lose this. And one of the reasons they bend over backwards is because, you know, they don't want any argument on appeal that they didn't accommodate or rule in their favor, kind of sweeping away any appellate holes or exposures. And then, especially if your case is really, really strong. And I think I think there is an argument. And I know we like to say that on this network that she's corrupt and she's incompetent and she's over her skis and she, the fix is in and she's a federalist. All, all potentially true. <laughs> what also could be true is that um, she's holding the prosecutor's feet to the fire where they have the burden of proof and for what she's seen so far from the pleadings and the things that have been presented, there seems to be an overwhelming amount of evidence in favor of the government and against Donald Trump. This is not, as I said on, on Saturday with Ben, Donald Trump doesn't, doesn't do complicated. His crimes and his frauds are the most basic and simple ever since the caveman went up to the cave painting and erased one number or horse and drew another one. That's, that's the fraud. And in Mar-a-Lago, he just took documents and then refused to give them back and used half a dozen people to move them around Mar-a-Lago or maybe move them to Bedminster and then re realized there were cameras and told people to erase the footage. I mean, this is the most basic. I mean, if you were, you know, the two guys in Home Alone 2 that Donald Trump is in, go back and look at it, were, were more talented burglars than Donald Trump in terms of their more sophisticated plan. What's the plan, Donald? You're going to take 96 boxes and 30 of them that are marked classified, and then you're going to lie to your lawyer and then involve six people within your organization to shuffle and then have the boxes delivered up to your bedroom and then look at them and then give them to another person and hope everybody keeps your secret? That was your fraud? That was your espionage? And the government has told... Um, uh, canon in no uncertain terms in papers. This is not a complicated case. There are 30 pieces of paper that are stamped top secret. Even if we don't put on any aspect of the case about the rest of the mound of documents, giant heaping mound of documents, some of which he referred to in that now infamous recording in Bedminster about the pile of Iranian war documents. He had a lot of piles like that. That's national defense information documents. That goes to Espionage Act. The government recently revealed in their filing, we may not even go down that route. What is the one term that was used over and over again at the press conference announcing the appointment of the special prosecutor, Jack Smith, by Merrick Garland? Obstruction. Not Espionage Act. Obstruction. 
the, the, the basic nature of this case has not changed from the day Jack Smith was appointed. This is an obstruction of justice case through the hiding and possible destruction of evidence. This is not, it is, it is because it's sexy to talk about it. It is not going to be tried as an espionage case. So we don't ever have to get down to, is this piece of paper national defense information? Is this piece of paper? Because the pieces of paper they're dealing with are the ones that are more classified and Donald Trump's conduct and behavior, knowing that they were classified and or NDI and, and hiding them because he wanted to keep them. So he had a revenge file he could use against people like Mark Milley, the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and anybody else, because they've already solved the mystery of the motive. They don't need motive. Everybody talks about motive because it's fun to talk about on that show that you work on Law and Order. Motive. What's the motive? Why did he kill his wife? What is the, or her husband? Why, what's the motive? Is not generally, generally part of the elements of any of the crimes that Donald Trump is charged with. Intent is. Intent is. But Donald. But they figured it out on the prosecutor's side. It's not for money. They kind of gave up on the trail of maybe he was going to use the documents in a transactional way to make cash. No. He's, he did it for the way he did it for Mark Milley, where he pulled out the file when Mark and started to attack Mark Milley and, and seek political retribution against people. It's his revenge pile. And that's why he kept it. That's why he had Hillary Clinton. That's why he had Mark Milley. He, the, the French prime minister pissed him off. Netanyahu pissed him off. So he had all these little piles that he was going to keep. The heart of the case is obstruction, not espionage act. So it doesn't really, the skiff is interesting. The, the SIPA is interesting, but it doesn't matter. It's 30 documents that are marked classified that he held on to and then hid using half a dozen people to do it. That's the case. And she knows it. And she knows, I think, the volume of evidence that's against him, tractor trailers worth. And so while she's bending over backwards on these issues and she feigns or is really pissed off and upset and takes her gavel home with her. Hmm, I don't like the way this hearing is going. I'm going to go home. Okay, that's all right. I've had a pissy judge before. I've had a pissy magistrate before. It happens. I'm not sure yet, and I'm not in that camp yet. I could be one day, but I'm not now, that that trial is going to move off of May. I still believe that she believes, as, judge, as does Judge Chutkin, that it is important to the American people that the trial of Donald Trump for the criminal matters get tried in public before the election and that he does it. If he's an innocent man, God help us, if he's an innocent man that he doesn't have the cloud of that accusation hanging over him either, whether you're on the Trumper side or the side of democracy, right? He needs to get his name either cleared or convicted, one or the other. So I'm not yet in the camp that because of this day-to-day -day back and forth, tit and tat, cat, mouse in the courtroom about some of these issues, it automatically means we're going to lose the trial date. I'm not there yet. Now, when she does it, you guys can say, remember Popak, remember in October when you told that really cute story, you're wrong. Well, that's okay. I'll be wrong. But that's my view. I'm not yet giving up hope about the stability of that date. Maybe a few more maneuvers, and I'll be wrong. But I know where you and I know where you Ben are on this one. Well, I'll tell you why I don't think it's going to go. Also, hey, Boogie, <laughs> I know Boogie. Oh, my my faithful my faithful dog, always here for every podcast. Hi, hey, Boogie. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it's dinner time. Um, uh, you know, I I think that I first of all I love your optimism, and I love that you still. Yeah very much. No, it's true. Like you want to, you look, I, I find it so hard to say anything negative about a judge or a federal judge. Cause, cause I grew up, you know, having so much respect for, for them, right. Judges are the, are the, are the neutral arbiters. They're the ones who are there to call balls and strikes and do justice, et cetera. And so I really hope you're right. And I hope, um, I want to think that about judge Cannon. Like I want to think that about every judge. And that's why I said, you know, maybe it's because she's inexperienced um, that that's why uh, some of these things are happening. But I really, I hope you're right. Um, although if Judge Chutkin's case starts when it's supposed to start, then Judge Cannon's case will get pushed probably just because they might still be on trial. <laughs> so we'll no, see. I agree with you. And that's why um, to sort of round that out, 
That's why I love Judge Chutkin because she was like, what, let me make a phone call up to New York and talk to Judge Mershon's chambers about the Stormy Daniels case, which is scheduled for March. I'm going to give him the courtesy. You okay if I bump you and I take it? I'm going to be the, I'll do the federal election case. Yeah, sure. Judge Mershon, we know this. It was reported that the staffs talked and she's allowed to do that under the rules and canons of judicial ethics. She's supposed to do that. She didn't make the phone call to Judge um, uh, a Cannon and she just said, let me see what's going on. What's the other date you got on there, May? Hmm. Who's it with? Cannon? Hmm. I'm going to take March. Because now we know there's definitely going to be, and of the two cases, it is the, it's the one that you've always said, Karen, to paraphrase you, it's the one that is the most important case out there, is the federal election interference case, federal style, in home court advantage, Jack Smith in the District of Columbia. I love Georgia, and I love the case. We'll talk about it next. But the one that I'm putting all my money, if I'm a you know, I'm at the track and I'm betting on the horses like my old grandfather used to do. I'm putting it on Jack Smith. Mar-a-Lago is really interesting. I like learning about SIPA and I like learning about, you know, how how both corrupt and juvenile and sophomoric Donald Trump's scheme was. But, you know, if, if God came down and said, you get one, son, pick one that you want a conviction in. I'm like Jack Smith, Judge Chutkin, federal election interference. Put them away. Not like, you know, the document, the documents thing. That's why I, I continue to believe it's the stalking horse used to exhaust the resources and the lawyers. And we're starting to see it for Donald Trump. Let me just leave it on this. Then we can go to Georgia if you're OK with that. Look at how thin these uh, lawyers are spread for Donald Trump right now. You've got Chris Keis backed up by Alina Haba and a guy I never heard of ever. Uh, Mr. Fields. Sorry, Mr. Fields in New York handling the fraud case of the century against Donald Trump, which literally could strip him bare. And as I said in the hot take, leave him wearing a barrel and suspenders selling apples on a corner. That is in the hands of one lawyer, Chris Keis, a backup from uh, uh, Alina Haba's firm. I thought Alina Haba was no longer a practicing lawyer. I thought she was a spokesperson for the PAC for Donald Trump, but she's there. That's his entire team. Okay. Not 10 lawyers, not a major national firm, two people. Then at the very same time, John Loro, who just joined the case in August, is the lead trial lawyer down in Florida. What happened to Todd Blanche, by the way? We don't see Todd. He sits in the courtroom up in New York, doesn't say a darn thing. That So that's going on. And in Georgia, we're going to talk about next, they brought in, uh, you know the guy, Steve Vesadow, who, no, who nobody down here has heard of, hasn't done a darn thing except go, me too, judge, me too. I like what she filed. I like what he filed. Um, that's their entire team against the United States of America and all of its resources and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people devoted to this case from a law, a legal standpoint, investigatory standpoint, and otherwise, and Jack Smith and a Jack Smith team that it's no less than 22 people of lawyers plus junior lawyers behind them and paralegals and investigators behind them. It's working because they can't even be in the same room at the same time. I mean, you know, if, if Donald Trump thought the brain trust was Blanche, Lauro, Keis, they, they can't even be on the same case at the same time. So you're right. That case is going to trial in March. Judge Chuck had made it clear. No doubt. That's going to take more than two months. It's going to interfere with the May case. And I'm okay with that. If the reason the May case doesn't happen is because he's on trial in the case in D.C., good. But, you know, let's let's leave it out there. We need one of these trials before November. And let's talk about Georgia now, because we know Donald Trump's case in Georgia is not going to be in 2023. And this case is going to take five months. So if this case does five takes five months, we're in, we're in October, let's make it November. November, December, January, February, March, April. Now we're in April. We're moving into the second quarter of 2024. April, May, June, you only got five, six months left before November, and you've got the Mar-a-Lago case. So he's going to get one case tried against him, Jack Smith's. The others are going to be bonus before the election. I'm not talking about ever. I mean before the election. What did you find down in Georgia? You did a very nice hot take. It's running right now. It's uh, Our hot takes are selling like hot cakes. Anybody like that one? I just came up with that one. <laughs> Um, and you have one running right now that I took a look at and I listened to on, uh, why don't you give a little version of it for those that don't watch your hot takes, um, 
Why aren't you watching Karen's hot takes, by the way? Or <laughs> mine, or Ben's, or all three of ours uh, at all. So tell us about the last gas motions by Sydney Powell and or Ken Chesborough. And then I can talk a little bit about the jury questionnaire and the fact that they're picking a jury starting on Friday. I'll take a couple of weeks, but they're going to start on Friday picking a jury. That's just, I mean, that's like tomorrow, basically. I mean, not quite, but you know, that's, that's literally, this trial is starting. This trial is about to go against the two who opted for speedy trial, right? There's 18 or 19 defendants who are charged and two of them, uh, Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell have opted for their to have a speedy trial, which in Georgia means lightning speed. So they are starting right now. And the judge is making the kind of rulings that they would make that he would make right before a trial. And essentially that what what happened was and what this order is, is he said that there's legally so the, the 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 punchline and the the ultimate ruling is there's legally sufficient evidence to support the charges against you. And so your motions to dismiss are denied. And that means all the the charges that that the two of you are charged with, Chesbro and Powell, are are going to trial. And you know, I love Judge McAfee. He's yes, he's also a Federalist and Republican and all of the all of that. But he's a great judge so far. He talk about a judge who is really smart, knows what he's doing, has command of his courtroom, and and he's also junior, right? He hasn't only been a judge for five minutes or six months or whatever it is. And he has this big case, but this guy knows exactly what he's doing. And I love his, 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 um, I love his decisions because his decisions, he knows that, that he has an audience here that is greater than just the defendants, which, so he's educating all of us. He's making it so that all his decisions are ones that anyone can read and anyone can understand, even if you're not familiar with uh, Georgia law. I mean, you know, like, like you, Popak, I read a lot of decisions and, and, and just court decisions in general can be very short, right? They can just be very brief, very short, or they can be very long. It just depends. And and Judge McAfee is making sure that even in cases, even in, in situations um, that are quite simple, he makes sure that he spoon feeds the information so that anyone who reads them is educated on Georgia law, not only on Georgia law, but also knows why he's ruling the way he's ruling. And and so I, I think his his rulings are, are very clear. They're very well reasoned. They're smart. He he knows what he's talking about, and he's clever too. He's he's funny. He's clever, and um, I love reading his footnotes. I mean, in general, footnotes are always where you get the juicy stuff, but his are are, are great. You know, he he always he always puts the best things in his footnotes. And 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 this particular motion, this particular order or decision on these motions, several motions to dismiss, uh, he addressed in one decision. And he basically um, gave a lecture on what a demurrer is, because that's what they, that's what they call it in Georgia. Um, these were motions, these were, these were for demurrers, which is basically a, a fancy word for dismiss. Um, and he, and he said there are three different types of demure motions in uh, Georgia. There's the general demure, the, then there's the special demure, and then uh, there's a speaking demure. <laughs> so I, I learned a lot reading these, right? And the general demure, he said, is basically when you ask the judge to apply, look, just look at the indictment, look at the charging instrument, you know, the thing that, that is being used to charge you. And what you have to do is make sure that each and every element of the statute is listed on there and that there are facts supporting each and every element of the crime. And, and I'm sure Georgia's like New York, you know, we had a computer program that when we were typing up our charging instrument, whether it was by complaint or by indictment, you put the statute number in there and it spits out the legal language exactly how it should be, because this is a requirement everywhere. You know, you have to have the the charges with the legal language and the elements and then the facts that support it. And so, you know, that's how we did it. Um, and I'm sure Fannie Willis made sure that they ha- alleged the fa- enough facts that very specifically met the law. And so he ruled um, that in particular, yes, she did with the RICO charge because that's, you know, the count one, the RICO charge. Um, and so he, and he said, this is how, and he, he said she, she alleged the right allegations and also the, the right um 
and the right facts that go with it. And then he analogized it to, um, uh, uh, so in a civil case, when you make a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. And so he said, look, that that's what this basically is, a general demure. It's, a, it's in the civil context, a motion to dismiss to, for failure to state a claim. He said, but in this particular case, you know, she met that. And then he said, that's different than a special demure, which challenges the form of the indictment, saying that, you know, we need more information than just the elements of the law. We need more than what you put there. And and he said, and, and the test for that is not whether the indictment could have been made more definite and certain, but whether it contains the elements of the offense intended to be charged and sufficiently apprises the defendant of what he must be prepared to meet. And in case any other proceedings are taken against him for a similar offense, whether the record shows with accuracy to what extent he may plead a former acquittal or conviction. So all that basically says is, look, let's say you are charged with something um, big and complicated. It's not enough to just give the statute and then the facts, the, the basic bare bone facts. You need to be a little more specific because later on, if someone tries to bring a, a different charge related to that, they need to know whether double jeopardy applies. So sometimes in certain cases, you need to be even more specific. And so he was saying, you know, there, that there's that kind. And then there's the speaking demure, which basically says, you know what, look outside the four corners of the charging document and look at the other evidence there. Um, like in civil law, that would be a motion for summary judgment that happens after all the discovery has come in. So you're just looking at just, you know, not only the, the document, the charging document, but all the other evidence to see if there is um, to see if there's enough to bring a, a charge and and essentially what he says is look there is no motion for summary judgment in criminal law that's what a trial's for in civil in in the civil world yes you can look at all that and and you know and dismiss a case if there's not enough but we don't do that in criminal in criminal law you have to have a trial and put your evidence in and and you know. Sidney Powell tried to put all these attachments on her motion saying, look, you know, I was allowed to break into the voting machines. And look, this this affidavit in a civil case says I can do what what they're saying I couldn't do. Therefore, you should dismiss this. And, and that was the speaking demure because she was asking the court to consider this other evidence. And he said, hold on. That's what a trial's for. We don't do that here where you look at this other stuff. You know, um, the judge doesn't look at that. And so she, he basically, you know, schooled everybody on how how criminal law is different than civil and how these are the types of hurdles that that you have to get through in order to get a case or a charge dismissed. He also, you know, he look, Ken Chesbro made some weird legal arguments. You know, he said that, you know, that, but he had to, right? He, there, there, nine times out of 10, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, defense attorneys lose most of the motions that are made before trial because that's just the nature of things, right? That's, that's what, that's how it goes. The prosecutors typically know what they're doing and, um, and they, they, but you still have to make motions and you still, if, as a defense attorney and you have to ask for things. And, and so this read to me, this motion that Chesbro made felt like gas, grasping at straws. You know, he said things like, Oh, you know, let's, let's dismiss it because, you know, they, they, they didn't do things that were in the legislative intent, but not in the statute. And the judge is like, well, no, the legislative intent doesn't, is not an element of the crime. That could just be what one senator thought should be in the statute, but that doesn't mean that wasn't voted on. That's not an element of the crime. And this is where the, my favorite footnote in the decision, um, when he said, um, when, when, what the judge said, he said, you know, he cited a case, B Bishop versus the state of Georgia, where he said, you know, any attempt to discern legislative intent beyond the express language passed by a legislative body is as practical and productive as attempting to nail jello to the wall. Like, how great is that quote, right? So, you know, so he shot down that argument and, and there was a couple, he also said, he also, Chesborough also said to the judge, look, you know, there's an element that they have to prove, which is, you know, continuity, meaning that, that the defendant, you know, would have continued, but for being arrested, he would have continued with the crime. And the judge is like, okay, yes, um, Mr. Chesborough, that is an element of the federal RICO statute, not the Georgia RICO statute. And PS, we have lots of Georgia case law that talks about how different 
different the statutes are. And so just because it's an element of the federal RICO statute, it's not an element here. But, you know, so the judge was kind of answering his motions, I think, in, in, in appropriate just saying this is not what the law is. But Powell's motions, I thought, were slightly different. The, the, to me, her motions kind of show why she is part of Team Crazy. You know, like, like at least Ken Chesbrough was, used to be a respected constitutional scholar and is, is sort of a, a real lawyer, which is partly why he's so dangerous and scary because he is kind of a real lawyer, which is why he was able to uh, come up with the plan to steal the election to begin with. Um, Sidney Powell is just not a respected lawyer. And I think she's, you know, not even respected by her own co-defendants. And that's why they, they called her part of team crazy. She was asking for counts to be dismissed. You know, she, she was like, Oh, I want, I want to adopt this person's motion and this person's motion and my own motions and, you know, all of that. But, and so she would say things that, and the judge was like, uh, by the way, you're raising arguments that number one, you know, don't correspond to anything that the government, you know, when, when you, you raised an argument and then the government responds, your reply is to something that has nothing to do with what the government said, number one. And number two, you submitted your motions after the deadline. And number three, you asked for charges to be dismissed that you're not even charged with, Sidney Powell. So like, get your facts straight. You know, she just doesn't know what she's doing. And, you know, but so that's, that's what the, that's what that was, was, that, that was that whole motion uh, that was ultimately dismissed uh, or not dismissed, was ultimately yeah. summarily denied and the trial starting. So with the judge, with the judge having squared away the last gasp of motions, including from Team Crazy and and Team Constitutional Scholar, we're left with a jury selection, 450 jurors being brought down. They're going to be told at the beginning that this is a five month trial and after the groans subside, they'll start the jury selection process, which will be televised, um, as will the trial and everything else related to it. We'll be following it here on the Midas Touch Network. The judge is already about to reject the question jury questionnaire that the uh, Team Crazy wanted, in which they were gonna have the jurors asked point blank like under penalty of I don't know what are you do what what's your belief on MAGA do you think Donald Trump had the right to challenge the election do you think people that challenge the election results are bad people or criminals you know the judge is like I'm not asking any of those questions <laughs> I'm not you're you're not allowed to ferret out their opinions about things just about whether they're fair and impartial and we'll come up with a better questionnaire that's more neutral on that point and we will start with that process one place we won't see a televised likely trial is in uh, Judge Chutkin's chambers in March for the D.C. election interference case. We've got papers that were just filed by the Department of Justice arguing that there should be no cameras in the courtroom. Um, some people might be surprised by that because we'd all like to see it. It'd make for great theater and we'd love it on this particular network. But I understand watching Donald Trump act out in New York and, and anticipating what he could do in Georgia. I'm not sure having it all televised and having Donald Trump have more cameras on him than already are on him is a good thing for the administration of justice. But we'll talk more about that after we see the full briefing. Um, quick sign off here for Legal AF Midweek. We talked about the um, midweek that we talked about the Legal AF After Dark clips that will be running on YouTube. And we'd like you to support that and send that over to people as a way to get them to support our show. You guys know how to support our show, the listeners, followers, and audience that have been with us for almost three years and 400 total episodes. It's free subscribe to the Midas Touch YouTube channel. Help them get to 2 million. The bigger they are, the more your voice is heard. You're watching now, but listen to us, the same episode over on the audio podcast platforms. That helps with the algorithms and helps keep us right where we want to be at the top of the charts at the intersection of law, politics, and justice. And if you want to wear something with our uh, podcast logo on it, we have it at store.midastouch.com and we'll put up a link for that during the show. That's the way to do it. Everything I just talked about, except for buying our merch, is a way to free support everything. And there we go with the link. Saturday, Ben, my Salas, and me will join and we'll uh, pick up from where the midweek edition left off in terms of developments. And to keep everybody au courant, Karen, me, Ben, my Salas, the leaders of Legal AF, with 75 years of collective experience that only comes from being a, 
certain age. <laughs> a you male love that female. phrase. I love you that love, phrase. I was like, I know Karen phrase. wrote that ad. I did. She said that, she said that <laughs> phrase again. Because uh, I don't want to you know, tell everyone my that I'm 57. Uh, oh, I'm 57. All right, there you go. There you go. Uh, uh, there, now we've said it. Uh, so with our 114 years of collective on this earth, we bring <laughs> our advice and counsel and analysis only one place exclusively on the Midas Touch Network. So until next midweek edition and all the hot takes we do in between and the weekend edition of Legal AF, signing off, shout out to the Midas Mighty and the Legal AFers. Legal AF.